Romans 5. <clears throat> we started last week with a preface to the chapter, <clears throat> seeing as Romans 5 is uh, arguably the greatest chapter in the greatest book of the Bible, in the book of Romans. And that being because we're now talking about not just how Christ saves, which we dealt with in Romans 3 and 4, by grace through faith, but what is resulted from salvation by grace through faith, or now you're justified by faith in Romans 5 verse 1. What are these blessings, the riches, the wealth, the, the treasures that you have freely given to you in Christ Jesus? So Romans 5 just starts listing these things, and it's just a, a glorious chapter in that regard. It talks about who you are in Christ and what you have in him. Yeah. And so that's why it's so great. And it's according to the mystery of Christ, which is this fellowship that's not part of Israel and their covenants and their earthly kingdom, uh, such that you can have these things now. That's what Romans 5 will talk about later. You have them now. So it's just an amazing chapter. And so we tar started talking last week about the peace you have with God in Romans 5, verse 1, and uh, the access you have with God in these other treasures here. In fact, Romans 5 through 8, these next three or four chapters, uh, will set us apart as believers. And that setting apart by virtue of the inheritance, the riches that we have, the position we have in Christ, is called sanctification. That's what that word is called, sanctification. And uh, the result of our sanctification is that we do not fit in to this world. So we start seeing in Romans 5, 6, 7, 8 how that is. It's not that we don't fit in because we're better than people. That's not true at all. It's like we've already covered we're all sinners and that we're saved by grace. And it's nothing we've done. It's through faith. Uh, but God himself gives us position, access, knowledge, uh, and, 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 and glory, hope of glory, such that it, we're now set apart. We start to think differently, to, to respond differently, to live differently as a result of our sanctification in Christ. And so these next three or four chapters will talk about that, okay? And we start the verse tonight in verse 3 with the four words, and not only so. We've only gotten two verses into the chapter, and already the list is continuing such that Paul's saying, and not only that, you know, it's like the salesman saying, and there's more, you know. Um, you're justified by faith, and uh, he's adding here to the treasures of justification and peace with God, justification by faith and peace with God, to access uh, by faith and the grace wherein you stand, you're standing by grace, and the rejoicing you have in hope, and that hope of the glory of God, all those treasures there, we listened about four or five of them just right there in two verses. Not only so, but we glory in tribulations also. So he adds to the list of the treasures he's already listed in the first two verses that you have in Christ justified by faith. And so tonight's subject is this glory in tribulations. Not only so, but we glory in tribulations also. What does that mean? Why is that a treasure? Uh, tribulations don't seem like a good thing. So how is this good? <laughs> that we glory in tribulations and how do you do that? And what does that mean? And how is that tied to our justification by faith? Uh, which is apparently a result of that. Okay, so that's what we'll cover tonight. So at the beginning of the lesson here, I want to define what tribulation is. What tribulation is. Tribulation can be defined in, in the scripture here as the, the pain of pressure that, that you face or that you have or, or the burden or the distress that you have or, or opposition, the pain of opposition. And so sometimes people use the word with persecution, which is, of course, an, someone opposing you by, with pain and affliction, right? This is all associated with tribulation. Or the trouble. You can naturally see in the word tribulation the idea of trouble, uh, trouble that comes from the opposition or from persecution or from, we might say, taking a beating, which could be both literal or just mental. Uh, in your life, there's times where you feel like you're going, uh, life is going with you, you're going with everything, and everything is smooth sailing, and the, these types of, of sayings that we use. Then there's times where it seems like everything is against you, and you feel opposition, and this is when stress rises. The biblical word is distress. It's not just mental, but it's also physical distress, or, 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 uh, or, or carefulness, full of care. We call it now in modern times anxiety. Or, or the pain, the physical, mental, spiritual anguish that accompanies not just the circumstances that confront you, but also real enemies of you. And, and whether they be just enemies in your life and frustrating the purposes you have, or more specifically in the context of Romans 5, those enemies of Christ who are against what you preach, what you stand for, and what you believe and what he said. Right? So all of that can be described as tribulation. Okay? And, and that, that's this idea of taking a beating. So... Uh, you, you see where the preaching can come from here. Are, are you taking a beating in life? Well, Christ can deliver you from that. Well, yeah, yeah, he can. How is really the issue. Yeah. How does he do that? And, and what does that look like? 
and uh, what we'll, we'll cover through Romans 5, 6, 7, and 8, is that he does deliver you from the beating you take in life mentally and, and spiritually and physically uh, through the resurrection, the hope of glory in the future. Uh, resurrection is, is how he does that. He also, however, gives you the peace of God within yourself. So no matter what happens around you, you can be taking a beating, and yet in, in your soul and your spirit and in Christ, you're at peace with him. And so you, you have that ability as well. And so there's, there's a, a, an amazing truth in this, that we glory in tribulations. Okay, well, I want to show you a few verses in the Bible that, that provide the definition I just gave you, so you know I'm not just making that up or pulling out of a hat. Though that sounds similar to how many dictionaries you'll look it up in as well. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 4. Look, look how Paul uses the word here. He talks about God being the God of all comfort. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all our tribulation. And so we do serve a God of comfort. He does comfort us in tribulation. So if you're asking, well, what happens when we're facing trouble in life? You know, can we turn to God for help? Yes, you can. Uh, he's the God of all comfort. The question is how he helps. That's what you got to understand, is how he helps. He helps through Christ Jesus. He helps spiritually. He helps physically in the resurrection. And so there's a way that you can understand that. So he comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble. Yeah. So you see trouble there associated with the tribulation? There's a definition to that. By the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. And so th th there's a good definition. Look at chapter 4, verse 8. Corinthians 4, verse 8. Paul says, we are troubled on every side. So similar to chapter 1, he says, we're facing tribulations, and we can comfort others who are also in trouble. Chapter 4, verse 8 says, we are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. And so here you see the teaching of Romans 5 in action, where Paul says we glory in tribulations, and why is that? Because you can face tribulations, and yet it not destroy you, apparently. Amen. You, can, you can face perplexity and not be in despair. The difference between perplexity and despair is despair has no hope, you see. The, the difference between uh, the trouble on every side, yet not distressed, and full of stress and, and hopeless, is there's no hope in that. And so all, all sense of worry and stress and, and uh, despair is a walking not by the faith you have in Christ, it's walking in hopelessness is what that is. And so Paul's explaining because your justification is by faith and not what you do, and because it's by God's grace and everything he did, and because he's given you these free things, peace with him and access to him and grace and everything else, you have a hope that you can rejoice in, and that hope also helps you not just to rejoice in, in today, but in any tribulation you face, you can have the same hope. So the tribulations, the troubles that, the, that you face do not affect the hope of glory that you have in Christ Jesus. Okay, and this is what Paul is teaching here. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 4. 2 Corinthians 7, verse 4. <clears throat> it says, Great is my boldness of speech toward you. Now we're just going to these passages here to, to try to define the word tribulation from the Scripture, which I try to encourage you as much as possible to find words from the Bible, because it'll help you understand the context. Great is my boldness of speech toward you. Great is my glorying of you. I am filled with comfort. I'm exceeding joyful in all our tribulation. So here's Paul facing tribulation, but of course he's responding in joyfulness and comfort and things like that. But verse 5, notice instead of the word tribulation, what he calls it. For when we were coming to Macedonia, our flesh had no rest. That would be tribulation. No rest, right? But we were, uh, we were troubled on every side. There's tribulation. He says, without were fightings, within were fears. That's tribulation. You see how he's, got, he's describing this tribulation that now he's rejoicing in, but he's describing what it was. He says in verse 6, Nevertheless, God that comforts those that are cast down comforts us by the coming of Titus. So there's the casting down there. There's the fears within. There's the fightings without. There's the no rest, trouble on every side. That's tribulation, right? And, uh, and to some extent, that uh, does affect everybody, whether they're saved or not. It affects everyone to, to various degrees. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, Paul, again, uses this word tribulation and helps us define it. In the Thessalonian context, who, who were facing persecution, physical affliction and persecution by their countrymen, Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 3, 
no, that no man, Paul says, um, he, he wants to send Timothy to establish them in the faith and comfort them, that no man should be moved by these afflictions, for yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. He says, we're appointed unto afflictions, for verily when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation, even as it came to pass, and you know. So you see afflictions, tribulation, that tribulation is afflictions. It's trouble, right? So you get, you get the definition here in some of these verses. So tribulation is a reality. Tribulation is something that occurs even to the Christian. As Paul is listing a treasure here, a wealth and a power that you have in Christ, which is to glory in tribulations, he doesn't say tribulations go away. Not only so, you'll never face trouble again. He doesn't say that. He doesn't say not only so, you'll never be afflicted, you'll never fear, uh, have fears within, you'll never have fightings without, you'll never have that. That's not what he says. He says you'll glory in tribulations. That's a different statement. It's also very different from in the Old Testament, uh, in Israel's covenants, what God promised Israel to deliver them from their enemies in the persecution. In fact, God even promised earthly, physical peace, peace on earth. Right? Their enemies would not be able to withstand their defenses, right? so they would be victorious in battle, like actual battle. You see, Paul's not promising this. He says you'll face trouble and tribulations, but you'll be able to glory in it. And he, he uses that as a treasure that you have in Christ. And so, as Christians, as believers, those justified by faith, we do not pretend that tribulations don't exist. As some actually, unfortunately, try to do. They say, well, we're Christians, and so we've got to put the smile on, and we've got to, look, you know, we're happy, right? Because God said we're saved, and now we're happy, and nothing bad ever happens. Like, no, that's not the scripture. That's not what Paul says. He doesn't say trouble doesn't happen. So we don't pretend it doesn't exist. It does. And it's not just out there with those people. It's like with us as well. It's all of us. There's tribulation. We also don't have the promise that it won't ever come to us. We don't think, oh, well, I had it before, but it's not going to come to me again because Jesus Christ, he's keeping me from it. Mm -hmm. That's not the promise. That's not the truth. So we don't pretend it doesn't exist. We don't think it won't come. Tribulation will come. And I, I got to make this point right now that I'm not talking about the prophetic time of great tribulation that Jesus promised uh, would come in, in Israel before Israel's kingdom. We're not talking about that. That is a specific time of uh, Jacob's trouble uh, and prophecy before Israel's kingdom come. We're not talking about that. We're talking about tribulation generally. Persecution of believers and, and truth and opposition to that, enemies of the cross and things like that, your own life and fears. And that's the tribulation we're talking about here. And he says you can glory in tribulation. The glory of Israel's kingdom comes when their kingdom comes. Right. Uh, this is talking about you're glorying now in tribulations in this life. Romans 8.18 says, the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed in us. So he's talking about present time, right? So we're not pretending it doesn't exist. We don't think it won't come. Tribulation will come. In fact, Paul said in 1 Thessalonians, he told the Thessalonians, I told you. I told you it happened. <laughs> so I'm sending Timothy to comfort you, lest you be afraid of why tribulation's happening. I told you it happened. It's going to happen. In fact, Philippians 1, Paul even tells the Philippians the same thing as they were worrying for Paul as he was in prison, worrying for him. And we worry. You know, this is our flesh. We have fears and there's persecution. And one of the natural responses to trouble is to avoid it. Right? One of the natural responses to trouble is to say, well, I'm not going to do that again. I'm not going to do the same thing that causes trouble in my life. I'm going to correct that and get away from it. But what if that thing that's caused the trouble is precisely the, the, the thing that God wants you to do? is the will of God, is the truth of God, is, is standing for that truth, or saying this is who I am in Christ, or preaching to someone else that, or telling someone forgiveness, then you got a dilemma. Your own comfort, or God's truth. Right? And of course, you should know what the answer to that dilemma should be. It should be, be God's truth. But that means Philippians 1, Paul tells the Philippians that it's not just, uh, it's not, not just for us to believe. What's he say in Philippians 1? He says it's, it's given to us also to suffer for his sake, which is interesting. Uh, Philippians 1, verse uh, 20. Unto you is given in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. There is no promise to Christians in the church that, that when you believe, your life will be roses and better. Like that, that is never a promise Christ gives. Now, you have the hope of glory, the hope, the future hope of glory in heavenly places, which is something you cannot have without Christ. Right? He says, having the same conflict you saw in me and now here to be in me. Now that suffering differs, of course. Uh, we're not suffering here tonight. We have a nice building out of the rain. It can be air conditioned and heat and things like that. There's not much suffering going on right here. 
but there's suffering in your circumstances, probably, things going on, frustrations in your life. There's also suffering of Christians in different, different environments. And there's no guarantee that God has given that because there's, you are here in, in Indiana, because there's so many Christians in Indiana or America or wherever, that there will not be suffering and opposition and persecution. There's no promise of that. Right? If the whole world turns against you, it is not a sign of degradation of God's ministry or spiritual truth. It is just the course of this world. And that's what the Bible says. Galatians 1.4 says that Christ has delivered us from this present evil world. We live in an evil world, which is why we can't call it the kingdom of Christ on earth. Because the kingdom of Christ is an evil. Right? But this world is, according to Galatians 1 verse 4, his kingdom hasn't come yet. The head is in heaven. He's left his body as ambassadors here to communicate his truth of reconciliation and peace to a world that has rejected him. Yeah. That's the evil part. It's not that everyone you meet on the street is, is going to knock your head off or something. It's that the evil is that they're rejecting Christ. And so when you try to preach truth, there'll be resistance, rejection of that, if not just apathy and ignorance. Okay. Uh, 2 Corinthians talks about, in chapter 11, how, or uh, excuse me, chapter 4, where the, the God of this world is the devil. So... And again, this, this is a mockery made by, by many people who don't even believe in the devil, but they'll follow precisely what the devil thinks, which is that God is unjust and you can do whatever you think you should do with your own life, and that's the devil's doctrine, right? And so they, they don't believe in him, but they actually do the same thing that he would have people do. So, and that's what Jesus said too about his, uh, when he came to Israel, to the same people in Israel who thought they were following God, but were not because they were rejecting Christ. So we live in a present evil world where the, the Satan's the god of this world, uh, where there's a, a, an acknowledgement, an obvious nature of suffering, there's no, and there's no promise in this treasure that we'll avoid it. You say, Justin, I thought this was going to be a, a good, glorious uh, chapter here. <laughs> well, I'm just pointing out the errors that people face when it comes to tribulations. There's no promise that the Christians will be safe from that and, and, and protected from those. The, the treasure here is that you can glory in tribulations, and which is interesting. Um, because that's an unnatural response, okay? Uh, what sets the Christian, or at least the, the, the Christian who's operating according to faith and grace, apart in their sanctified position, walking in that sanctified position, is that uh, it's not their lack of tribulation. It's not their life with less trouble. Well, you know they're Christians because their life just has no trouble in it. That is not an indicator of people's spirituality and faith, okay? Uh, but our unnatural response might be, the unnatural response that we have based on truth, which is the glory that we have, the hope of glory we have in tribulations, is something you can only have if you trust the gospel. And by this, Paul's not saying simply endure it. There's a lot of people that can physically endure different sufferings for different reasons. He's not simply saying you'll get through the thing, which people do, other people don't, right? He's saying glory in it. That's a different thing, the glory in it. He's not saying you'll muddle through and endure. He'll say you'll glory in tribulations. Now, you've got to ponder that. Because that, that, if you could do that, that would actually be great. If you can glory in what everyone else gets a frown and frustrated and angry and distressed about, you can glory in it, that would actually be a much more positive thing. I mean, so you can glory in times of peace. You can glory in times of trouble. Yeah, that, that might help. Right? So how, how does that occur? And so this should be the question. Is, and it's how do we have... Glory in tribulations. In Romans 5, in verse 3, it says, Not only so, but we glory in tribulations, knowing that. The way the Christian, those justified by faith, can glory in tribulations is based on what they know. Right? Which is why we'll get to in a little bit here, why there are even people who are saved, who are believed the gospel in Romans 5, verse 1, who don't know how to glory in tribulations because they don't know what it is that causes them to glory in tribulations. Because... Glory is you rejoicing in. It's you responding in the tribulation with, it's not just an optimism, okay? It's a real hope of good things. Yeah. And, 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 and like I said, that's where the danger comes in. Because Christians want to look at in the face of trouble and say, oh, no, that's not really that bad. It's going to be good. That's not what we're doing. Bad is bad. It's not saying, oh, no, there's no bad things happening. All things are for, work together for good. No, 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 there are bad things happening, right? But it's you having a hope, an expectation of a real good thing, <laughs> in the time of trouble around you, which causes you to rejoice and glory in it. So I want to cover what we know then. Romans 5 says that we know some things, and uh, 
we're going to answer how we can glory in tribulation. Where does the strength come from? Where does the hope come from for us to glory in tribulations? Men naturally glory in their strength. In fact, even when, when hard times come to people, and uh, men often, often have this kind of response uh, to trouble, not, not, not all men, but some men, you know, they're real competitive or, or real aggressive, and when a, a challenge comes, resistance comes, you know, they double down. You know, I'm going to smash that thing down. I'm going to be victorious over this thing that's against me. And this is where, again, preaching prevails, preaching from wrong dispensations prevails, where, you know, you got Goliaths in your life, well, you can take that stone and you can knock that thing down and cut its head off. And everyone goes, yeah, God's victorious. Um, that's not the promise, remember. That's not what Paul said. He didn't say you'll defeat the tribulation, you'll get it out of your life. But that's precisely what David did, right? Killing Goliath. Right? So that was the promise to Israel, exactly, but not to you. People glory in their strength. David, of course, gloried in their strength, being the God of Israel and his covenant promises that they would not be defeated. And so that's why he stepped out boldness in battle and won the battle and the victory because that was what God promised him. His hope and trust was in God. He was their strength. But believers in this dispensation, in this dispensation of the grace of God, saved by grace, where God's dispensing his grace, and that's how he's working, um, have a different explanation of, of how and where we get our strength and how, what that looks like, rather. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 30. There's a lot of references tonight in 2 Corinthians because 2 Corinthians deals a lot with suffering. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 30. So if, you, if, you, if, you're, if you're dealing with suffering, you want to know, do a study of Pauline truth on it, 2 Corinthians is not a bad place to go. But 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 30. Paul says, If I must needs glory, I will glory the things which concern my infirmities. Typically, people, men, mankind, glory in their strengths. Okay, I'm taller, I'm stronger, I'm, I'm, I'm smarter, I'm, I've, I'm skilled at this, uh, you know, I, I, I have these strengths. Right? And yet, Paul says, if I'm going to glory, if I must needs glory, because the Corinthians were challenging him to glory at himself, if I must glory, I will glory the things which concern my infirmities. Who glories in that? He's like, well, here's my boast, here's my strength, I'm the weakest man in the room. And that doesn't seem right in our flesh. That, 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 that you're losing at that point, you're not winning, you see. And yet, this is what Paul says, and this, this is the attitude that the, in the mind that the Christian has this to say. Look at chapter 12, verse 8. You mean they're insane? <laughs> well, to the world it is. It's such a change of mind and a way of thinking about God's intervention in the world based on what we know that people think you're just wacky. This is the sanctification. It sets you apart in your thinking, positionally, right? Chapter 12, verse 8. Paul, in chapter 11, 30, he says, I'm going to glory, glory my infirmities. And he actually continues talking about this subject into chapter 12. After 12, verse 8, he says, he had a thorn in the flesh. And he said he besought the Lord thrice for it, because this thorn in the flesh is weighing me down. Like, this thing's hurting me. I could do better if it wasn't there. Have you ever prayed that prayer? This thing's troubling me in my life, God. If it were out of the way, I could do more for you. You know, I could be stronger if this thing were gone, right? I could do more if I didn't have this responsibility, if I didn't have this burden, if I didn't have this distress. I could, I could do more for you. Common prayer, right? And yet Paul says, if I'm going to glory, I'm glory in my weakness. In chapter 12, verse 8, he says, I besought the Lord thrice to remove this from my flesh for the same motivation I just expressed. And Christ said to him, my grace is sufficient for thee. Which is not Jesus saying no, by the way. This is not Jesus saying no. <laughs> you know, you got enough. You know, he's saying my grace is sufficient. He's saying my strength and power is in my grace. And you, Paul, are misplacing the source of your strength. Because it's not in you. It's in my grace. You are insufficient. My grace is sufficient. That's what Paul, uh, Jesus is saying here, right? So it's not that he's saying, I'm sorry, you're just going to have to be the weakling. Now, Jesus is giving power and strength. He's telling Paul, you're trusting and looking in the wrong place for it. Right? So every Christian who thinks that God has promised to heal their flesh, to give them fleshly strength, is misplacing their hope. Yeah. Because the strength God's providing is not that. It's spiritual, and it's greater than that. And again, this boggles the mind. How can there be a greater source of strength than what we can see with our eyes and lift with our arms. It's like, well, there is. That's the teaching of Scripture, right? And so in chapter 9, Paul says, uh, my, or Jesus says, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength, the strength of Christ, 
is made perfect. It is at full power in weakness, meaning in your weakness. My strength, Jesus' strength, is made perfect, complete in your weakness. And so Paul says, most gladly, therefore, when Christ told me that and taught me that, Paul says, because he loves Christ, and he loves what he's given to him freely by his grace and everything else, he says, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities. You see how he just explained why he said what he said in chapter 11? If I'm going to glory, I'm going to glory in my infirmities. And everyone's going, what? That's why. Because Jesus told me the real power is in his grace, his sufficient, abundant grace. Amen. It's all glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may respond. You see what he's saying there? Jesus didn't say no. Paul is reorienting where he's getting his power from. And it's based on what he knows about Christ and his grace, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities. Now, that's a different thing altogether. It's one thing to glory in your infirmities and say, you know what, this infirmity in my weakness means that Christ is stronger in me, and so I'm going to glory in that situation. But now Paul says, I'm going to take pleasure in it. That's a different type of thing, because <laughs> pleasure? I mean, now you're feeling pain. I mean, thorn in the flesh doesn't feel good, and he's taking pleasure in it? Well, why? Because he, apparently he, the pleasure he's getting is not from the actual pain, obviously. But it's, it's from the love he has for Christ, or from the love of Christ in him by God's grace. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches in necessities and persecutions. Infirmities are physical weaknesses. Reproaches are, are those people that blame and that, that suffer you. And then there's necessities, things that you need. And Paul needs things. Well, as long as I got things that I need, I'll trust God, you know. Didn't, 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 didn't God say, even uh, with, with food and raiment, be content? And, and, and the house isn't really part of that list. But anyway, food and raiment, so just necessities. You know, without that, I'm okay to grumble and complain. You know, I'm hungry without food, <laughs> you know. Um, well, Paul says necessities, even in necessities, okay. In persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. So the, the thought here is that any, any affliction that he faces, tribulation he faces, is for the sake of Christ to be able to preach his grace. And so you've heard me say here before that one of the greatest testimonies that we can have in this dispensation as a Christian is not in times of greatness for in your own life that people would see and say, oh, that he's doing so great, but it's actually times of your weakness and suffering and pain even unto death. It's in those times where you have the greatest opportunity to communicate the grace of Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, and why is that? Because the life then that you're living, which doesn't seem like a life at all, it seems pitiful and distressed and knocked down, you can claim Christ's life. Right. You can say, the life I live in the flesh is not mine, it's Christ's life, which means that if this flesh stops, I get glory. Amen. Resurrected glory. Right. My hope is not in this life, in this flesh. That's the message of Christianity, is in Jesus Christ. And so you can see how that gets hidden when Christians have a life that looks like it's worth living. You understand? When Christians have a life that looks like it's not worth living, and nobody wants to live that life, the only thing they can preach is Christ. And guess what Christ wants you to do? Preach Him. Yeah. So when your life looks like it's worth living, people look at you, not Christ, and they say, I want to do what they're doing. Yeah. Right? And then, this is the evangelical method, right? And then when they come to me and see the greatness of my life, then I'll tell them, really, I'm so great because I trust Christ. You know? And the, the people do that. And then they're like, well, I'll trust Christ too. But what's that communicating? Christ promises good life, right, in this life. No, that's not what he's giving. That's not what he provides. And when they see it doesn't come, they say, what's the use of God in Christ? Eternity, <laughs> hope and glory. You know, it's not in this life, though. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, if, if in this life only we have hope, we're of all men most miserable. But most Christians don't walk like that's true at all. They think the only the hope that's really in front of them that Christ can provide usefulness to you is in this life. And if it's not in this life, then there's no hope at all. Well, that sounds a lot like the world, not actually someone enlightened by the truth of God, God's truth and his grace. So people glory in their strength, but believers, Christians, and here Paul is strong in weakness. He says, for when I am weak, then am I strong. Amen. Christ's strength is no more clearly in his own weakness. And thus, he says the contradictory statement, when I am weak, I am strong. Talking about himself in the flesh versus himself in Christ. When I in the flesh am weak, then I in Christ 
and strong. That's what he's saying. Okay, and that's the testimony of the Christian. That means that, that's how ministry is being done now, you see. And so Paul says in Romans 5, verse 3, we glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation works patience. So there's something we have to know. That's why Paul had to be taught by the Lord Jesus Christ about his sufficient grace. That's why Christians have to be taught. It's not something just by the fact that you're saved, you suddenly glory in tribulations. That's not what happens. It's based on what you know. This entire dispensation, it's based on what you know, which is why the Bible itself was, hasn't been around. The Bible has not been around since the Garden of Eden. Like, there was Adam, who was part of the Bible, but the Bible, the complete thing, was finished in this dispensation for you who walk by faith so you might know things and then walk based on what you know. That's why we have this book. God didn't always operate through the entirety of the complete scripture we have now. Okay? Uh, it was piecemeal, progressive. By, we covered that in our, in our Bible series. So to glory, we must know some things. We already know some things in the previous two verses. We know some things in Romans in the last 30 weeks of study of it. We know faith. Right? Faith in what? Faith in Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. Uh, faith is necessary for justification. Faith by itself, without works, without covenants, without circumcision, all that. It's faith. We, we know Christ, how it was through his blood shed that righteousness can be given freely by his grace. And so it's what Christ did and who Christ is. We know peace. Being justified by faith, we have peace with God. We know grace and how grace was necessary. If it's going to be by faith, it was by faith that it might be by grace. And grace has to be there. Otherwise, you're, saved, you're helping to save yourself. So grace, faith, Christ, peace, hope is now understood. You have eternal life in Christ Jesus. Eternal life. You already knew you had life now. You already knew life was limited now. The promise in Christ Jesus is eternal life. Amen. So that's the promise there. It's not the better life. It's eternal life, which is better, but it, it's, a time, it's forever. It's, it's from him. And so we know those things. We also know a few other things if we study Paul's epistles and study the Bible here. Romans 15, verse 4, we know scriptures, don't we? At least you should, which is why we study scriptures. Romans 15, 4 says, Whatsoever things were written aforetime, written before Paul, written in the scriptures before, were written for our learning. Yeah, yeah, so we should really love to learn, you know? It's not, learning isn't the end, do you understand? It's not that learning is the objective of life. Learning gets you to a, a place of understanding. And so he says, they're written for our learning that we, through patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. Hope is the destination you want to be in in this life, looking forward to what glory is going to come. Right. And so the, the learning of scriptures through patience and comfort provides hope, which is actually a pretty good recipe for hope there. So how, do I, how, how does hope generate it? You know, the hope, the, the expectation of a good thing. Well, patience and comfort. You take strength and you take the waiting through time with this, this, this good, good attitude or expectation. That's, that's what hope is. Patience and strength. It's hope. Right? In fact, many philosophers have talked about just the need for hope in humanity, which is, of course, true. People are hopeless. Without God and Christ, they're hopeless. Right? What's the proof for God? Well, on a practical level, you want proof for God. Without him, there's no hope. I mean, everyone acknowledges this. They don't talk about it, but they acknowledge it. There's no hope. Life is just now. In fact, all the argumentation will be about, well, if it doesn't help me now, then it's worthless. Because their assumption is that now is all there is, which means there's no hope. Right? There, there's no real hope for people without Jesus Christ, without God, without his grace. Which is why Paul even said Ephesians 2, without Christ, you're without hope. You pretend... You live like they, you can expect some good, all the while cr continually living, corrupt, you know, living in corruption and dying and decaying and heading towards death in the grave. Right? That's what it is. That's your life. You pretend that it's not coming as fast as it is. You pretend that you're not actually getting older than you are. You pretend that circumstances aren't getting any worse than they are. It's like, no, that's all pretend. That's why it's, it's a treasure to be able to glory in tribulation. You can be truthful and honest about, yeah, this is getting bad. Yeah, I'm getting older. Yeah, my body's falling apart. Yeah, that hurts a lot, right? Well, why, why, are you, why are you saying that? Why are you acknowledging that? Shouldn't you at least put on a happy face? No, my hope's in glory. Amen. Right? I'm waiting for that. Right? And so and that's what's going on. And so knowing the scriptures, Colossians 1, verse 9 through 11. Of course, when someone says they have a hope, they, they better have some evidence for this, yes? Colossians 1, 9 through 11. 
You can't just claim a hope, a false hope, and think that it's true. You've got to have evidence for it. Of course, the Bible describes faith as the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith comes by not just a wish in your heart, comes by hearing the Word of God. What evidence do you have of this hope of glory? Well, God spoke. God spoke. Colossians 1, verse 9, This cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, and to be desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of His will. Christians have an, uh, an aversion to this idea of head knowledge anymore. And I, I'm not quite sure where it came from, uh, because the Bible teaches you need to value knowledge and understanding more than rubies and treasures and gold and silver and all the rest. But Christians have this aversion to knowledge, as if you have head knowledge, this is not as good as having a heart. Well, one actually leads to the other, and they're related. You know, like even people who are our nerdy academics have hearts that they might not use them very often. They have them. And like knowledge is useless without a reason and a purpose. You know, and that sort of thing. But Colossians 1 verse 9, Paul prays that they be filled with knowledge. Filled with knowledge. We don't want too much. No, he said filled with it. The knowledge of his will, God's will in all wisdom and understanding. So the specific knowledge here, knowledge of God's will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. You might understand spiritual things. Well, God's beyond understanding. Well, Paul wants you to understand spiritual things for a reason. Not just that you know them, and now I've learned we know stuff. No, it's verse 10, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. There's the knowledge of God you can only get after understanding something and then walking in it, and then you learn more by the learning and walking in it. That way you know. Which is why ministry is so important. Like your own ministry, you're actually living and walking out what you know, because you can only know some things by doing that. Going through that. But Paul says that you might increase the knowledge of God. And then verse 11 says, strengthened. So after you learn something, and then you walk a bit, and get more knowledge, then you're strengthened now. You've gone from a place of weakness to strength, but you're not strengthened in your flesh, or in your own ability, but in the understanding and knowledge of God, and with all might, according to God's glorious power, his glorious power, unto all patience and longsuffering with joyfulness. There's things that we know. Ephesians 1, 3, we have all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We know these things in the scripture. And it's by knowing them that helps us to glory in tribulations. Because we're not glorying about the tribulation. I'm really glad that guy, you know, cut me off and crashed my vehicle yesterday. I'm really glad that my left leg fell off last night. And it's like, this is not the attitude. It's that what good thing can come out of this evil world and all the tribulations in it? Christ and life and what he's done and what he's provided. That's the good thing. That is a real thing, just as real as the things happening to you in your flesh in this world that you can rejoice in. If you don't have those things, by the way, there's nothing to rejoice in. As far as the, the, those, you can't rejoice in them if you don't have them. Right? So this is why Paul lists as a treasure to glory in tribulations based on what we know. We also know that our hope is in the Lord, <clears throat> not in ourselves, not in this life, not in our security. It'll be financial security or physical security or emotional security, any of that. It's not in any of that. Philippians 1 verse 20, <clears throat> Paul says that to him to live is Christ and to die is gain. Remember that? <clears throat> Philippians 1, verse 20. According to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed. Paul's confident, isn't he? Confidence means with faith. Nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness as always. So now also Christ will be magnified in my body. He has confidence and hope that Christ will be magnified in his body, whether it be by life, if I stay alive, I'm going to magnify Christ in my body, or by death. Paul just said, if I die, I can magnify Christ. That's what he said. So there's something that we have to know and realize based on what Christ has done and who we are in Christ that no matter what happens to you, you have a hope of glory and Christ can be magnified. Okay. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. The opposite of this understanding is to say that I'm going to magnify myself, which is what most people are trying to do. They don't state it like that, that frankly, but they're trying to live life and improve themselves, make themselves better and better and better and better and such that, they, that they're magnified. Okay. But that can only happen as long as you're healthy, as long as you're able, as long as you have resources, as long as you're alive. If any of those things stop, 
sorry, you, you, your, your hope is gone, right? I mean, your hope was in those things, right? And now you don't have any job, you don't have any money, you don't have any friends, you don't have any life, you're sick and deathly, and then now what? You got nothing. You're pitiful. You're not magnified at all. But if you're magnifying Christ, <clears throat> if that's the understanding, and Paul says, whether by life, by death, I have, I don't have, it doesn't matter. Christ be magnified because of this truth. That's a more glorious thing. We also know that our hope is future. The hope is not now. Romans 8, 18 says the sufferings are in this present time, but we shall be glorified. We shall have glory. In 1 Corinthians 15, <clears throat> 19 and 20, that's what I quoted earlier, that Paul says if we in this life only have hope, we're of all men most miserable. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. Why? Well, I see a lot of happy Christians, right? or, or non-Christians. Right? Well, if you're, if you're living the truth of the gospel, not living a lie, which many Christians are, by the way, then what is happening is that there's tribulation in life. If you're open and honest about reality, you'll see that there's, there's miseries that everyone faces. Right? And more so for Christians who try to communicate truth and do the will of God, this makes life even harder. You can have a lot more free time if you weren't here tonight, if you weren't here on Sundays, you weren't here next weekend. I mean, I, I would have a lot more free time. I know that. Uh, I might at first not know what to do with my life, but then I'd figure something out, I would think, and then I could do something else, something more great. In fact, the world might think that it's more great and more productive than what I'm doing here. Like, what are you doing, just talking to people? Right? What, what is this? What, what is this happening? You're just trying to, to make people feel better? based on an imaginary spaghetti monster in the sky or something? Like, why don't you build a, a skyscraper or help the poor in, the, in this world or something like this? Or, or go feed the hungry and, you know, or clean up a street somewhere, right? Yeah, sure, do these things. But there's something greater than all of that. Amen. But see, that's what's rejected. And then why do you do what you do? Because it's true, but it's by faith. Because I understand that it's true. I believe that it's true. But 1 Corinthians 15, 19 says, that's why we're moment, uh, of all men most miserable if our hope is in this life. Because I, I, you can work a lot more time and get more money if it wasn't for church activity and ministry. If it wasn't for time spent in prayer. Like, you, ever, you ever had that confrontation with yourself and been like, well, I'm supposed to pray each day. I'm supposed to study the Bible each day. I'm supposed to minister or, or something. And I just don't have the time. Yeah, I've heard that before. I've heard that for myself before. I don't have the time. What do you mean you don't have the time? Like, everyone has the same amount of time. What you're saying is, there's something I think is more useful to spend my time with than that. That's what you're saying. That's what we all say. That's what, what we mean when we say we don't have the time. We're busy. We're saying, that's not worth my time. Okay? And that's really, uh, that's really conflicting. It's, it's convicting as well, but it, it, it makes you feel a little guilty in the context of, well, I know that's what God would want. Right? Well, then you're making a choice wrongly, aren't you? Yeah, and we all do that. This is a daily, a daily thing. But the point here is that it's miserable in the eyes of your flesh and the world to make those choices when it seems like there might be better things to do with your time. Right? In verse 20, but now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. If Christ is risen from the dead, everything changes. Yes. If Christ rose from the dead and he presented the gospel, he preached the gospel, offers salvation to you who believe by grace through faith and makes you a new creature in Christ, justifies you, gives you access with God, you're at peace with him. We're not trying to make peace with God. He, he, we have peace with him through Jesus Christ. Things have changed for you. Right? There's something more valuable. Life is less miserable in that context. Our hope is future. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18, Paul talks about the hope we have in resurrection, which is a future hope. In this context, <clears throat> this is 4, verse 13. I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others, which have no hope. I, I neglected to read this verse on Sunday. That was, it was printed right there on your outline, about no hope in hell. That, what's that verse say? When people die, you don't sorrow as others who have no hope. It doesn't say they have a hope sometime in the distant future, past purgatory. No hope. Some people who are dead is what that verse is talking about. But you, you the, the believers that are asleep, they're dead. You don't sorrow as that. They're gone, but it's temporary. Verse 14, if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. That's a hope that you have. Verse 16, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel. That can only happen if the Lord is resurrected from the dead. Amen. Do you understand the significance of Christ's resurrection? If he's not risen from the dead, 
then he's not coming back. He's not risen from the dead. He's not judging anybody. He's not risen from the dead. There's nothing you have that you owe him anything for. But if he rose from the dead, then you owe him everything, and he's your judge, and he's returning to this, lo- this world. And, and Paul says, he'll descend from heaven with a shout, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in, in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. In tribulations, comfort one another. When people die around you, when your brothers and sisters die in the faith, comfort them that they will return with Christ since Christ rose from the dead. Amen. That's a hope of glory. It's only when you haven't been to many funerals that you think that's worthless. Like, no, that, that's an amazing, beneficial and profitable treasure that Christ gives you freely. To rejoice at a funeral, which, which we've talked about funerals briefly before, but the only reason why funerals in the West, one of the primary reasons that in funerals in the West, you go there and it's a somber thing. You dress up in black or something, you go there and it's a quiet environment. Right? is because of that verse and this idea of the resurrection, of burying the body and not burning it, burying it so that it may, the, the symbolism is that it raised back from the dead, it's sleeping, okay? It's the idea of the symbolism. But the idea of quietness in the funeral, right? Why is that? Because in Eastern civilizations, they wail. Have you ever heard this? Yeah. Someone dies at the funeral, they will wail. Like, purposely, intentionally, as an observable witness of their grief. Ah! And like everybody's doing it because someone has died. And here in the West, we go to a funeral and we go, Why? Why aren't you wailing? Why aren't you just screaming to the heavens? I mean, for, for the person who was married to or related to that person, you just lost a very significant person in your life. And people weep. I, I'm not saying they don't do that. But the environment generally is more peaceful. I'm saying there's a tradition that goes back with the understanding of Christ's resurrection that we don't sorrow as those who have no hope. And to the Christian who knows that, because not everyone at funerals in the West understand that, but if those who know that are believers in Christ, you can actually rejoice at a funeral. Glory in the death of a saint. Why? It hurts in the flesh, and there's pain there, and you're weeping, and you miss, but it's like they're in a better place quite literally. Now, I say literally because that phrase is often repeated and never really believed. But if you trust Christ, it's a reality. Amen. And if you actually believe it, then you're glorying in tribulations. Christians don't act like that, which tells you something about what they know or what they're acknowledging. We can know the power of our Lord Jesus Christ when Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 5, when he talks about comfort here to the Corinthians, he says, as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation, our comfort abounds by Christ. Paul says, if we're suffering, we're suffering as Christ. What does that mean? Well, Christ was from heaven and came down to earth and suffered. Now, you were born on the earth, but now that you're saved, you're an ambassador of the third heaven. And so why are you even here? Like, why didn't he take you with him? Well, he's left you here to minister, to minister in a world of suffering. Right? So the sufferings, Paul associates with the sufferings of Christ that we partake in. Right? We're members of his body, and they abound in us. So also, our consolation, our comfort abounds by Christ. So if Christ came down to earth and suffered, and we're members of his body, and we're living this life in a world of suffering so that we can minister to other people just like Christ did, then we also can rejoice and have comfort like Christ did that he's going to be risen from the dead. Now, he did it by his own power. We did it by his power. Right? By faith. But that's the same comfort. Jesus knew he would raise from the dead by his own power. We know, too, by Christ's power. We know by faith. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 5. We preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord. Christians should get off the boat of preaching themselves. Because they do. They do it in a not very selfish way. They try to give God the glory for it. You know, I'm giving God the credit for my great success. Like, that's how it's preached. I've climbed letters so high, I praise God for it. I like to thank God for helping me win the Super Bowl this year. Or I like to thank God for helping me this part. Like God, God is, is in the strengthening weak people, not getting credit from the strong people business. You understand the difference? 
if Christ's strength is, is Christ is made strong, his power is made known in your weakness, what does that mean in your strength? You say, well, shouldn't people give credit to God for what he's done? Yes. Right? You hear that, actually, it's a surprising uh, positive change in some of the, the athletic events where you'll hear uh, athletes more often now actually talk about Jesus' death on the cross more than they used to, which is good. It used to be they would actually praise God for the victory, and now it's just, I've heard of multiple times from different athletes saying, it doesn't matter if I win or lose, you know, I'm a Christian. And it's like, oh, well, that, that's nice. That's good. That's true. It doesn't matter if you, if you win or lose. It's not God will give me the victory, and I won't because I'm a Christian. But we know the power of the Lord Jesus Christ in his death and resurrection. In chapter 4, verse 7, we don't preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and, our, and ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Down in, in verse 7, he says, we have this treasure in earth and vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God, not of us. We have the treasure of the glorious gospel in this weak environment in our flesh so that we can say that's not us, it's him. When people look at you and say, well, how do you claim all these treasures and rejoicings and strength? And you say, well, it's not me, that, it's not mine. It's God's. Well, why are you so special? I'm not. It's by his grace, through faith. Now you're preaching the gospel. See, every time someone can respond to you in your circumstance, your response is simply by the gospel, because I'm justified by faith in what he did for me. He gave these things freely to me, and he said so. And I trust him. So everything is four down in verse 10 and 11. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. You're living his life now, in your mortal flesh, right? So just as Jesus in mortal flesh hung lifeless on a cross, and yet he came back to life, your mortal flesh can be falling off your bones, and you can still have life in Christ. Amen. You see, it's the same way. That's what he says here. Because we have an e a hope of eternal glory in verse 17 and 18. It, it makes this life and this tribulation, compared to that glory, a light affliction which otherwise would not be a light affliction at all. Right. And Paul says, we, uh, for our light afflictions, but for a moment, he's comparing it to the eternal weight of glory. Because in this moment, it doesn't feel like a moment, and it does not feel like it's temporary or light. Right. But compared to glory, eternal glory, it is. That is, if you believe in the hope of glory that you have in Christ Jesus by grace. You see, it all comes back to faith and what you know about the gospel here. So we know those things. We know the mind of Christ. In Philippians 3, verse 8, Paul says that all things that were gained to him, he counts as dung for the excellency of the knowledge of the Lord, his Lord Jesus Christ, that he know the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. That's what Paul says in Philippians 3, verse 8. That's him applying Romans 5. That everything else that he has that was gained, and he lists a whole few verses of things that were boasts in his flesh. He says, all that's just, it's nothing. It's meaningless. Because I want to know Jesus Christ in the fellowship of his suffering, so I may know the power of his resurrection, so that his power may rest upon me. Right? He's looking for that resurrection, not only in glory, but to operate now in his thinking and his mind. Philippians 4, 6, and 9, Paul says, I can do all things. He says, I have learned in whatsoever state I am in, therewith to be content. He learned that means you've got to know something. You've got to know how to be content in every circumstance. By Philippians 4, by the time he says that in Philippians 4, uh, he's already communicated four chapters of the mind of Christ. And he says, I know both how to be abased and how to abound, everywhere in all things. So I know how to abound, that's not tribulation, or to be abased, that is tribulation. I know how to be full, not tribulation, and to be hungry, that's tribulation. Both to abound, not tribulation, and to suffer need, that's tribulation. So you, see, you rejoice in the hope of the glory of God, and not only so, but you glory in tribulations too. No matter the circumstance, you can rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. You can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth you. The verse says the all things you do is tribulation or not. That's the all things, and you can do it in Christ, because he's your strength. That's what the verse says. Okay, that's the teaching. So you see how so these teachings later in his epistle, Philippians and, and Corinthians and the Colossians and Ephesians, all, all come back to Romans 5 here. And what he says, but we glory in tribulations also. So why doesn't every believer, every Christian just glory? Why doesn't every Christian then automatically have that glory in tribulations? Because we all don't, right? We have all had tribulations before where we grumble and complain like everyone else. Right? Why isn't we just naturally 
glory and tribulations. Because there's weak faith, number one. If you don't know why and how, you won't. Right? You can believe Jesus, but if you don't know the things we've been studying here, just in this, this short lesson, then you, you won't know how, how to glory and what to glory in the tribulation. Secondly, if you don't acknowledge the things that you have. You may say, well, I've heard the lesson, I, I hear what you're saying, Justin, but you, don't, you won't acknowledge them. Philemon 6 says that the, your faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing that is in you in Christ Jesus. So the faith has the effect of you glorying in tribulations when you acknowledge the reality of your faith. Amen. Christians tend to do this a lot. They believe, and then they just kind of put it away and don't actually live according to their belief. I and mean, this is a common thing. I'm not, I'm not even talking about works. I'm just talking about living actively like what you believe is true. If you believe there's an etern eternal life, eternity, and it's glorious, and you have the promise of that glory, you don't spend near enough time thinking about it. Neither do I. It's like we don't. Because we're just so nearsighted and focused on this thing right here. And so when things disrupt our, our life here, we're going, ah, God help. And he's like, I have, by giving you the hope of glory. That's too far away. That's the whole point. It puts things in perspective. Because you've lost perspective. You think it's about this here in your calendar. It's not. It's about something greater. And so why does every believer glory? Weak faith. They won't acknowledge what, what their faith is or what God has said and promised them. Or they have a misplaced hope. Because if you have the wrong faith, you have the wrong understanding of what God's doing, then your hope's misplaced. It's not in the Lord. It's in your flesh. It's in success. It's in this life. And that's why every believer is in glory. So you see how coming to a knowledge of the truth is very important here. What you know is very important. When Paul says, knowing that, he says, tribulation works patience. That worketh there is only a reality when the faith that you have rejoices in the hope of glory. If your faith cannot do verse 2, it will not do verse 3. Do you get that? Verse 2 says, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. That last phrase has nothing to do with tribulations. It's just that that's the consequence of you having access to God's grace in life. You can rejoice in hope. Now, if that rejoicing in hope does not trigger any glory in you, then you're not going to do verse 3 at all. Because if you can't do it in peacetime, you're not going to do it in tribulation. You see, that's the point I'm making. So the working, how tribulation works, patience, is only when your faith is in hope of glory. And when your faith is in the hope of glory, then when tribulation happens, then you can glory in tribulations too, because your glory is not in the circumstance. Amen. So when your glory is not in that, it's not going to work. Okay. Tribulation will happen to you, and you say, why isn't it working patience? Because you're not glorying in the right thing. Your faith isn't in the right thing. You, you don't understand how to rejoice in the Lord always, Philippians 4, verse 4, before he says you can do all things through Christ. Okay? So th that's where the work happens. 1 Thessalonians 2.13 says, Paul thanks the Thessalonians for their faith which works effectually, for hearing what he said and receiving what he said is the word of truth that works effectually in them that believe. It has an effect in you that believe what he says to be true. It doesn't just receive it and then keep doing and thinking the way they've been thinking. Okay. So tribulation works patience is what Paul teaches. Now, this is patience that it's working here, which is a, the right word to use. It's not merely endurance through suffering, which, like I said, can happen without glorying at all, uh, or perseverance, which is, you know, the, 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 the tenacity to go through the continuous to get through something. Like, you've all had that to one degree or another in different circumstances. But patience, real biblical patience, the patience that is of hope, the patience that God it, it works in, Okay, that tribulation works patience, is something that is not produced because it's in you. It's produced because of the hope and love of God. Okay. Patience it has the definition of being able to wait through time with a good mind, with a right mind. It's not simply enduring you know, and muddling. It's having the right mind. Now, so when you have hope, expectation of a good thing, you can, through the time of tribulation, say, I still got that good thing. So you have the good part. Now you're waiting through time part. That's patience. 
That's what patience is, waiting through time with the good, the good mind, the right mind. And so in that origin, it's not, because, it's not you saying, I'm going to just think happy thoughts. The, the, the happy thoughts, the good, comes from the hope you have in Christ Jesus. Yeah. That's the good, and you're just taking that with you through time. So that's patience. So it's because of the hope and love of God. In fact, 1 Timothy 1.16, don't we know that Paul says the characteristic of God in this dispensation that is uh, most, under, most uh, on display is his long-suffering. That the long-suffering of God might be the pattern to them which hereafter believe. It's God's long-suffering against sin. So if God's showing his long-suffering today towards sinners, and then here you are living in a world of sinners, and you have his grace, and you have access and stand in his grace, doesn't that mean that you then have a power to suffer long as well? Well, yeah, because you have good things and promises and hope that you can suffer through. And so you have that. An example of this would be the Thessalonians. In 1 Thessalonians 1, verse 3, Paul thanks them for their labor of love and their work of faith. Remembering without ceasing. He said, we give thanks to God always for you, making mention of you in our prayers. Remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ and sight of God and our Father. Their patience, their waiting with the good mind is the mind towards what God promised them in Christ Jesus. Okay. So this is that example of tribulation working patience. The Thessalonians were being persecuted because of their hope in Christ. They had the right mind about that through that persecution and thus their tribulation work patience. If you don't have the right faith, if you don't have the hope of glory, then you will not be patient through tribulation. You can endure it. You can thank God that I endured it. But on what basis did you endure it? Because you don't need Christ just to endure suffering. People, like I said, have, have engendered the, the willpower to do that sort of thing sometimes. But uh, it's, it's why. And so the whole point here of it working, if God's working in you, is because of the hope that's working in you. And that is an unlimited... Un, uh, 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 it's, it's a source that is unable to be depleted. Amen. Okay, and that's the idea. So it's not simply willpower. He says, tribulation works patience, patience experience. Patience works experience. Now, in other translations, this word experience will be, made, uh, will, sh will be uh, translated character. Right? And this is one of those examples where word choice, I think, matters. You say, is it totally out of the ballpark? No, not really, but it, it does matter, I think. Experience could be a, a, a proper word here because we're not talking about you engendering the willpower as someone who just loves God and be a good soldier of God, so I'm just going to fight through and then I'm going to have good character through this. And it's like, okay, that's a, that is a thing. But that's not what Paul's teaching. Paul is teaching because of the hope you have in Christ Jesus, that you have something by God's grace that allows you to have patience produced because of that hope, to have experience as a result of that. So this is not your proven character. It's not that you've gone through tribulations with patience and now you're proven to be a good Christian. You've got that, that bar on your shoulder. That's not what Paul's saying. He's saying by God's hope, that the hope of glory you have, through tribulation, patience is created. And when that happens over and over, that patience, that continuance, you now gain experience. And the experience is not your proven character, but the joy of hope proven to you. Do you understand? You believed it, but it didn't actually have the experience in you until you went through a time where you needed it, and then you trusted it more, like, I need that now, and then it worked. And now you're going, yeah. Now, if that hasn't happened to you yet, you just haven't lived very long as a Christian with this knowledge, because it happens. Where you believe something, yeah, I believe that, yeah, it's true, and then you actually have to use it. Right? Well, that's a different thing. Like some major suffering happens, some greater tribulation occurs to you. The loss of your friend, your wife, your spouse happens to you. What do you do then? Do you sorrow like those who have no hope? Or don't you? Right? And then you use what you know from the scripture. And then suddenly, you know what? That worked. And now you have experience. Not because you're proven, because God's proven to be true. Amen. You see? And so that's the idea of experience here. It's not your character. It's the character of God. It's his, it's his work. That's why it's the hope of glory in God, in Christ Jesus. So experience can be defined as this, this confident assurance that the confidence grows as, as you see it work out. It's faithfulness, the faithfulness of God in this case, through your circumstances, as you trust what he said would happen. 
In verse 14, 5, Paul says, let every man be persuaded in his own mind. That's why you can't be down on Christians that haven't had the experience yet, right? I mean, you just can't do that because, like, it's not, it's not their job to generate experience. Like, life happens, okay? And life will happen. So, you know, some of us have more experience than others. But talking about the situation, Christians who know the doctrine have the opportunity to gain more experience with God than those who don't know the doctrine. You see, which is why you have to start with understanding. Amen. You have to start with knowing truth. Second Timothy 2.2, 2, Paul says to commit to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Well, what makes them so faithful? It's not simply because they graduated with a degree. That's simply knowledge. That's just knowledge. You need knowledge, but it, not just knowledge. You need knowledge practiced to generate what God generates through that information. And that's what, what, what makes an experienced minister, right? Can you not minister unless you're experienced? No, you can minister when you're not experienced. In fact, ministry itself is one of the ways you use what you know. And so when should I start ministry? You know something? Do it. <laughs> you get some experience. Learn what not to do. Learn what to do. Learn how God's word works. Learn how God's word is actually true. And I, I, it's hard to express it in words. I knew it was true before. But then I ministered. And you know what? It's more true now? Can it be more true? I thought true was just yes or no. But I, I get more confident. I'm assured that it is because of the experience. So experience in this case, in, in tribulation, is the faith that you had, the justified by faith, the gospel of Jesus Christ, and what he's provided for you freely, proven in tribulation. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6. <clears throat> Paul says in 2 Corinthians to the Corinthians that they should prove their ministry. We'll cover this next weekend, how we're all ministers. It's not simply a few of us. Everybody who's saved in the body of Christ has given the purpose of ministry. Now, what specifically that is, is different. By ministry, I do not mean stand behind a pulpit and teach to a big audience. That's just one way. But ministry is, is, is you walking, living, communicating what God told you to communicate, to live by, to walk in. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, look, look at this example here. He says in verse 4, he says, In all things, don't receive God's grace in vain, he says, in all things, approving ourselves as the ministers of God in much patience and affliction. How do you prove your ministry? Which is being your life in Christ. In much patience, in afflictions, in necessities, in distresses. Isn't that the same thing Romans 5 is talking about? In tribulation. In stripes, and imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in watchings, and fastings. Well, how? How do I prove it? Okay, I prove it in the, in the hard times is when I prove it. But by what? By what tools do I use? By pureness. You don't compromise truth. Amen. Right? By knowledge. You don't operate like you're ignorant. By long-suffering, which means you don't give up the first time something bad happens. By kindness. Right? So you have charity working out. By the Holy Ghost. You depend on God working you in his words. And not try to create a new tactic just because things are, times are changing and it's getting bad out there. By love unfeigned, by the word of truth that needs to be rightly divided, by the power of God, by the armor of right. This is the tools you use to prove your ministry. But when do you prove them? In time of tribulation. Yeah. Well, how do I find that? See, now you're asking, well, how do I find tribulation? Well, that's not like someone looking to glory in tribulation is what that looks like. Sure. Right? Yeah, it, it'll show up, right? But so now you're just like, well, if I'm going to prove my ministry in these situations, because I can't really prove it if everything's always great and successful. In fact, oftentimes, great material and worldly success coming to ministries actually is a motivation to compromise, yeah. which is amazing. Because God's blessed me so far, so I'm going to just divert over here and over there. And No, you have to stick to the word of truth. <clears throat> but that's the experience Paul's talking about here. Tribulation works patience, and now you've endured uh, by God's hope through the situation with the good expectations, why it's patience with hope. And now you have experience. It's proven in tribulation. And then experience produces the hope, the strength of hope. And this is not our hoping. It's not a verb that we're hoping for something. It's the hope in Romans 5, verse 2, the hope of the glory of God. Because that's what provides the that creates the patience in you. That's what gives you the experience that you're now, it's proven to you that his hope works. And now you have more strength of hope. It's the hope that you have in pain or peace. Hope defined here is the, the good that you can confidently expect to gain. Paul says in Philippians 3, verse 7, all those things that were gained to me, I kind of but loss for this knowledge, for this hope in Christ Jesus. Okay? And what's 5 5 says it's a sure hope. He says, it, it's a hope that maketh not ashamed. Now, why? Because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given to us. This hope does not make ashamed. The hope that he's described by the 
the justification and resurrection and glory and the riches and access you have, it's not a false hope. It's not a wish. It's not simply, I hope so. It's a reality. Why? Because our, our hope is sure and certain because of what we know. 2 Timothy 1 verse 12 says, I am not ashamed because I know whom I have believed. Remember that verse? Why is he not ashamed? Because I know. I know something. How do you know it? Well, it's by faith. But that means by what God said. God spoke. I hear the word of God. And I, I believe I know it. You can know things by faith. Right? 2 Timothy 1 verse 12. See, the difference... The reason why people don't have faith is not because they don't have the rationale to make a wish, because that's not what faith is. It's that they simply do not accept what God said. That's the difference. They can read what he said, but they don't accept it. Right? God has given a book of instructions, like a recipe. And you can read the recipe, but until you follow it and eat what it creates, you don't know what it's like, right? And that, that's the idea. Who says the love of God, how do we, how, why is hope make not a shame? Because the love of God, which is grace, that's what the love of God is manifested is his grace, which is given to us, or is shed abroad in our hearts, is what he said, that shed abroad in our hearts by faith. So that's faith, that's what he's talking about. By the Holy Ghost. Well, what's that? that that's you hearing what God said. The Holy Ghost gave the mystery to Paul. Christ revealed this stuff to him. It's the gospel of salvation, which has given to us. The Holy Ghost has given to you as a seal. In Ephesians 1.13, as the earnest of your inheritance. He's given to you in Ephesians and in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 as the one who makes you helps you understand, teaches you the deep things of God. This verse is interesting. We'll pick it up next week in this verse, but this is the first mention of the love of God in Romans. The first mention of the love of God, that phrase. And the next time it shows up is in Romans 8, 37. The next four chapters we'll dealing will flesh this out, this love of God. The love of God is made known in the gospel of Jesus Christ. He committed his love that while you're sinners, he died for you to give you all these riches. In Romans 8, 37, he says, nothing separates you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Nothing does. So he's already explained the love of God in Romans 3. He explained how it's by faith and nothing you do in Romans 4. In Romans 5, he's telling you the riches it provides by the love of God. In Romans 8, he says there's nothing that can separate you from it. Like, so it's the next four chapters, he's, he's, he's working out the details and, and the practical working out of these, these riches you have. This is also the first mention of the Holy Ghost in the book of Romans. First mention of the Holy Ghost. Here, look at 1 Corinthians 2. What's interesting about mentioning the Holy Ghost in the context of glorying and tribulations is that it's, the whole, it's by the Holy Ghost that you know things. And I'm not turning Pentecostal here. Because the scriptures were written by the Holy Ghost. Holy men of God moved as they spake by the Holy Ghost. First Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10. When you, when you think of Holy Ghost, what the Holy Ghost is saying, you should always be thinking of inspired scriptures. He dwells in you so that when you read his words with faith, it's true. You know that it's true. First 2, verse 10. God has revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all the things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of man, uh, save the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knows no man but the Spirit of God. How do you glory in tribulations? By knowing things that God has told you that is unnatural for you to respond with. But now that you know them, you can respond that way. And how do you know them? It says, the things of God knows no man but the Spirit of God. And he says, now the things would, uh, yeah, the Holy Spirit. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. What's Romans 5 about? The things you're freely given by God. Which is why Paul says, there's the Holy Ghost. That's how you know. Hope is not a shame, because the Holy Ghost said it. He communicated this truth. Okay. Know you not, you're the temple of the Holy Ghost? What well, thought the Holy Ghost wrote the book? Well, he also dwells in you. He wrote these words. He dwells in you. That's how it works. That's how it operates. Amen. And so we'll, we'll leave it there and pick it up next week in Romans 5, verse 6, as Paul continues talking about the love of God and how you know what God's love looks like. So, any comments, any questions about that? Yeah, Ray?